to uh, to share the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, sir. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, I'll I'll answer, and uh, sir will be sharing Hi. the PPT. Just to wait for one or two minutes. Uh. Can you see my uh, my screen? Yes, yes, we can see you, your slide. Okay. So uh, tell me when you want uh, me to start. Sir, in uh, two to three minutes, sir, we'll start. Most okay. of our fellows and colleagues are joining. Almost we have 25 delegates. So another five minutes we'll wait and then we'll start, sir. Okay. Hope it is okay for you, sir. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. You must be very busy with the ESISM preparation, sir, nowadays. Yes. And we are really thankful to you. You found uh, your time for us from your busy schedule. Really thankful to you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I am very busy. Yes. Not only uh, due to the ESISM meeting to prepare, but also due to clinical activity, uh, teaching activity, research activity, etc., uh, uh, etc. <laughs> Right, sir. Yeah. I mean, uh, this will be a great session, and the students would really like to interact with you also today, because this topic is quite important uh, for all of us. And uh, uh, you know, basic understanding of heart-lung interactions is very, very difficult. Unless we understand the concepts, uh, we will keep on lingering around understanding this concept. So today, it will be really, uh, you know worth having uh, you with us today for this topic and on behalf of uh, Norber uh, Polo Hospital we uh, uh, welcome you today sir just a more matter of a couple of minutes uh, so I think you will be yeah, yeah, no, problem. No, no problem not worry yeah the number is going up people are joining So, sir, ESICM will be in this uh, time in Paris, I suppose. Is it uh, in your hospital, sir? Some, no, some... no, 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 no. It's not in my hospital. It is in a, in a congress, a big congress center in Paris. Okay. Because we we expect uh, around five to six thousand people. So, my my hospital is not big enough to <laughs> to receive all these people. No, no. We need a very, very big Congress center. And all the so, workshops are being there? All workshops? Hmm. It, it's spread across Paris. Yes, workshops too. So we have a scientific program in parallel with an education program. So okay. two parallel programs, of course. You can, uh, you can uh, participate in, uh, in the scientific and in the uh, educational program, of course, but this is a big, uh, big program. 
plus uh, TV uh, TV program also. So all the workshops are in different uh, hospitals, or it is in the same? Uh, no, 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 no. The all the workshops will uh, uh, will be uh, located in uh, in the congress center. Okay. Okay. With simulation uh, uh, programs, with uh, many things, but all in the same in the same uh, uh, location. Okay. Okay. Great. <clears throat> So, uh, should I start the introduction? 57 uh, people have joined. Should yeah, I, I think, I think we can want, start. Do you, want, do you want to wait for, do you want us to wait for a couple of minutes more or? Uh, no problem. 60? I can, I can wait for, I can wait for a couple of minutes, of course. Yeah, 60 people have joined till now. It's good. How many, how many uh, attendees you you we expect. expect it you should go more than 100 every time we go more than 100 okay so uh, and you you do this every 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 week we do it every, every week sir. okay yes. and friday in general which is in friday friday so most friday. Is, mostly it is in the thursday 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 or thursday. friday thursday or friday seven o'clock what, what is the best for for you uh friday or thursday 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 will be convenient for us mostly and this is the 24th of our programming series. So we are going to complete next program will be 25th. From yeah. our because many programs uh, in India are during the weekend, no? Yeah. Yeah, so Thursday maybe it's be is better because it is a uh, little bit uh, far from the weekend compared to, to Friday. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But so since basically... a lot of society programs are usually kept on the weekends, so that's why for our uh, students and fellows, we have kept uh, this program on Thursday, actually. Yeah. So that it will be convenient for them on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So the number is going rapidly up. Uh, 66 have joined. Let us uh, start the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all today for the session on uh, heart lung interactions. We will try to understand physiology behind uh, heart lung interaction today. I'm Dr. Akhilesh Tandekar, critical care consultant at Apollo Hospital. And with me, my co-colleague, uh, Dr. Gunadar uh, is also there. Dr. Gunadar Padi is a coordinator and a critical care consultant at Apollo Hospital, Nabi Mumbai. Uh, it will be a really great honor and privilege to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, uh, Jean Louis Tabul. Uh, he is quite uh, famous. Probably he doesn't need any interaction, but let me uh, brief about his accomplishments. So, Dr. Tabul is uh, 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 welcome, sir. Uh, before giving your introduction, I would like to welcome you, sir. And Dr. Tabul is a professor of uh, uh, therapeutics and critical care medicine at University Paris South uh, in France. And his clinical activity at the medical ICU uh, uh, also involves research uh, in heart lung interaction uh, and cardiovascular performance. He has done a lot of uh, studies on understanding the fluid responsiveness. We all must have heard a lot in our conferences. And uh, that is his passion uh, to understand the fluid responsiveness and hemodynamic monitoring. And then uh, he has also uh, proposed a new test to assess uh, fluid responsiveness, uh, such as pulse pressure variation and uh, uh, passive leg raising test. Uh, to his accomplishments, he has got 184 articles, which are all referenced in PubMed Index Journal. And he has also written 204 uh, book chapters. And he has conducted a lot of didactic uh, lectures also and uh, most of these uh, lectures and the work that he has done is on hemodynamics. He is also editor-in-chief of Annals of Intensive Care. And he has uh, 617 invited lectures, including 450 in International Congress. Currently, he is the chair of cardiodynamics section 
of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, you have long introduction, sir. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, brief, uh, uh, be as brief as possible as far as the introduction is concerned. And let us focus on this topic. And uh, over to you, sir, Professor Tabul. And uh, uh, we will have uh, this presentation for 40, 45 minutes. And after that, we will have uh, 15 minutes question and answer and panel discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So before we start, we just request all the delegates to put their questions in the chat box so that we can take the questions in the end of the discussion. Thank you. So we can start, sir, please welcome you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so hello, everyone. I am very, very honored to be invited in your, in your program of lectures. And uh, just to just to say that uh, I, you you talk about my uh, short uh, CV. Just to say that uh, in fact now I am not the uh, chair of the cardiovascular section of the SICM, but I am the president, the chair of the Congress Committee of the SICM. Uh, I was the chair of the cardio uh, dynamic section in the past, and uh, now also I have more than uh, one thousand uh, lectures. <laughs> And uh, this is one uh, one additional. I am very very honored and proud to to be part of this uh, of this uh, conference uh, program. And uh, I will try to use forty minutes, maybe forty minutes, to 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 see with you uh, what is the physiology of heart lung interactions for the the intensivist. Of course, I will not give a physiological uh, lecture, but uh, applied uh, physiology lecture about heart lung interaction, what we need to, to, to know uh, for the clinical practice. So uh, I will start. And I would, I would like to describe, in fact, three parts of uh, heart-lung interactions. First, uh, the hemodynamic effects of mechanical insufflation, so in a patient who is mechanically ventilated, what are the effects of mechanical insufflation? Second, hemodynamic effects of PEEP application, and third, to finish, some words about hemodynamic effects of prone position. So uh, the effects of mechanical insufflation when you use a, a ventilator, uh, this mechanical insufflation could have a, an action on venous return. And uh, I like to use this kind of uh, cartoon which is a representation of the thorax uh, with the lungs, with the heart, the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, and uh, the vena, vena cava and the aorta. Just to remind that when you use a ventilator uh, during a volume controlled mode, you increase the alveolar pressure during insufflation. And this, this will increase the intrathoracic pressure. But of course, the increase in alveolar pressure is higher than the increase in intrathoracic pressure. And the difference is called the transpulmonary pressure, alveolar pressure minus intrathoracic pressure. The increase in the intrathoracic pressure will increase the pressure in all the organs into the thorax. And this will increase the actual pressure, the right actual pressure. And this, during insufflation, will impede venous return because this is a back pressure 
to Venus return. But at the same time, during insufflation, there is a descent of the diaphragm, and this will increase the abdominal pressure. And the increase in abdominal pressure will in turn increase the mean systemic pressure, which is a virtual pressure, which is considered the upstream pressure for venous return. This is a, a pressure in the veins, in the venules, which is considered the upstream pressure for venous return. But this will promote venous return, but in fact, the increase in intratoxic pressure is higher than the increase in abdominal pressure, and therefore, the uh, mechanical insufflation will decrease, will decrease, will increase the difference between the right atoll pressure and the mean C-string pressure, and this will decrease in a sweet turn. So if I put all this on a, a graph, this is venous return or calic output on the y-axis, and these are the pressures, the right atoll pressure and the mean smic pressure. This is a venous return curve according to the Guyton model, and this is a Frank Stalin curve. And before applying mechanical insufflation, before increasing intratorsic pressure, you start from this cardiac output point here, which is the equilibrium point uh, of uh, venous return curve and Frank Stalin curve. This is this point, which is the equilibrium point, optimal point for a given right at all pressure. So if you increase the intratorsing pressure due to the increase in alveolar pressure related to mechanical insufflation, you will increase the right atrial pressure here from this uh, baseline point to this pressure, and you should decrease venous return. But at the same time, you increase the abdominal pressure due to the descent of the diaphragm, and this will shift the venous return curve here to the right. So this will, I would say, lessen the reduction of cardiac output induced by intratoxic pressure increase, and therefore the new equilibrium point is here. here. So you have a decrease in cardiac output, but this decrease is not so high due to this compensation by the abdominal pressure increase. I hope that this is clear. So finally, the mechanical, the mechanical insufflation will decrease cardiac output uh, due to the increase in intratoxic pressure, which is higher than the increase in abdominal pressure. <laughs> now, the effect of mechanical insufflation on a right ventricular ejection. To well understand this, we should uh, remember uh, physiology again, and we should remember that in uh, the pulmonary vessel, we have in fact two categories of vessels, of microvessels. We have the extra alveolar vessels, and we have the intra alveolar vessels. If you increase lung volume, secondary to the increase uh, due to mechanical insufflation, you can dilate, dilate the extra alveolar vessels due to the stretching effect of uh, increasing lung volume. But at the same time, you compress you compress the intra alveolar vessels. So two different effects of increase in lung volume. So now, of course, if you dilate the extra 
have a lot of vessels, you should decrease the resistance of the extra vessels. And to well understand this, I like to refer to this uh, relationship, physiological relationship between the pulmonary vascular resistance on the y axis and lung volume on the x axis. This is residual volume, this is FRC, and this is TLC, which is the total lung capacity. In fact, when you increase lung volume from the residual volume, you decrease the resistance of the extra vessels because of this stretching effect of increasing lung volume. But there is a minimum here, which is uh, like a hyperbolic curve. So you have a decrease in the resistance of the extra alveolar vessels. But at the same time, as I said, you have an increase in alveolar pressure due to the increase in lung volume. You have an increase in intrathoracic pressure. And therefore, you have an increase in transparent pressure, which is a difference. Again, during each mechanical insufflation, the alveolar pressure increases more than the intratorsic pressure. And therefore, the transpulmonary pressure increases at each mechanical insufflation. And this will increase the resistance of the intra alveolar vessels. So, to well understand this, we have to remember the west zones in the lungs depending on the uh, gravity. This is the top of the lungs. This is the bottom of the lung. And this is the vessels. And this, this represents the alveoli. Uh, in the zone three, which are the zones of the lungs, which are the, represent the bottom of the lungs. Normally, the pulmonary artery pressure, which is, which is here, here, is, incre is higher, sorry, than the venous pressure, pulmonary venous pressure, of course, and both pressures are higher than the intra alveolar pressure, and the flow is maximal in this part of the lung. And this zone is called the zone three. In zone two, in zone one, sorry, the alveolar pressure is higher than the pulmonary artery pressure and the pulmonary venous pressure. Why? Because the pulmonary artery pressure and venous pressures are lower at the top of the lungs compared to the bottom of the lungs due to the hydrostatic difference, due to the gravity. As you know, at the top, the pressures are lower than at the bottom. And therefore, these pressures can be lower than the alveolar pressure. Essentially, during mechanical insufflation, if you use a high tidal volume. And there is no flow in the zone of the lungs because there is a compression of the uh, vessels by the alveolar. And there is an intermediate zone, which is zone two, where the pulmonary artery pressure is higher than the alveolar pressure, which is higher than the pulmonary venous pressure. Because the pulmonary venous pressure could be lower than the alveolar pressure, again, due to the gravity. And therefore, in this zone, there is a compression at the venous side of the uh, lung vessels, micro vessels, of course. And therefore, there is an increase in the resistance of the vessels in this zone compared to zone three, where the resistance are minimal. So the resistance increases from the bottom of the lung to the top of the lung. So if we go back to the graph I already uh, talked about, the resistance of the intra vessels, which are 
directly uh, in contact with the alveoli increases from the residual volume uh, to the total length volume, like this. A hyperbolic curve, but in the opposite side compared to the resistance of the extra alveolar vessels. And there is an optimal point here when you have the resultant effect of the, of, um, the uh, relationship between pulmonary vascular pressure, uh, sorry, pulmonary vascular resistance and lung volume, the minimal resistance are at the FRC. So F F FRC represents the minimal resistance because this is a resultant effect of an increase in intraveral vessel resistance and decrease in extra alveolar vessel resistance. Okay, so FRC is a minimal for the resistance. This is physiology. So now you inflate the lung due to mechanical insufflation. If you use a low tidal volume, you start from the FRC at end of expiration, and you increase lung volume, not so much because you use a low tidal volume. And therefore, you increase pulmonary vascular resistance only by a, a small amount, small increase. It's good. Of course, if you make a mistake and you increase a lot tidal volume, as we did in the past, as we did 20 or 25 years ago, you have a higher increase in the primary scalar resistance uh, for an increase in tidal volume. And this is an exponential increase because there is an extension of zone two conditions in this case. Of course, if you increase tidal volume, you will increase more alveolar pressure and you will compress more the pulmonary vascular, uh, the pulmonary lung vessels. And you have an extension of the zone two conditions. This is why the reduction of tidal volume is good, not only for the lungs, the protection against uh, uh, lung injury induced by tidal volume, but also for hemodynamics and for the right ventricle, because as you know, the primary vascular resistance directly impede the right ventricle rejection. So using a low tidal volume is good for the RV because you increase only a little the primary vascular resistance, and you decrease only a little the right ventricular ejection. And this was so well illustrated in the past by some studies. For example, this study coming from uh, the group of Francois Jardin and Antoine Villarbaron in France, <laughs> they look at the relationship between high plateau pressure which at that time was a, ref, a reflection of using high tidal volume compared to low plateau pressure. As you can see, there is an increase in mortality. Of course, we are not sure that mortality was high due to the increase in plateau pressure itself or due to the severity of lung disease, of course, uh, which required an increase in plateau pressure. Nevertheless, in this study, they also looked at the presence of acute corpulmonale, which is the extreme form of right ventricular dysfunction or failure. As you can see, the higher the plateau pressure due to high tidal volume or due to reduced lung compliance, the higher the plateau pressure, the higher the incidence of acute corpulmonal. So confirming that high plateau pressure is not good for the right ventricle. 
And this is a more recent study <laughs> looking at uh, the impact of uh, protective ventilation. So using limited tidal volume on the right ventricular function. And in this study, which was a, a multi-center study with a, a lot of patients, 752 patients with ARDS, the authors looked at uh, the presence of acute core pulmonale, which was defined as an increase in the RV endoscopic career over LV and the securia ratio more than 0.6 plus the presence of septal dyskinesia. So right ventricular enlargement plus septal dyskinesia, it was used for the definition of uh, acute corpulmonale. And they found that the prevalence of acute corpulmonale was 22%. So meaning that if you use a protective ventilation, limiting tidal volume, you still have some uh, right ventricular dysfunction, but not so high compared to if you use high tidal volume when it was the case here, 60% uh, uh, for the presence of acute corpulmonale with, uh, with the use of uh, high tidal volume. So in this study, they also looked at what were the factors responsible for uh, the presence of acute corpulmonale, and they found four factors. And one of these factors was a driving pressure above 18 centers of water. As you know, the driving pressure is a difference between plateau pressure and um, PEEP. And therefore, it is directly related to tidal volume and compliance of the lungs. And therefore, this means that tidal volume is very important uh, in uh, the uh, effect uh, on the right ventricle because it increases the driving pressure and it could, it could cause RV uh, dysfunction or acute core pulmonary. So we should pay attention of the, uh, on the driving pressure, we should not be so high, too high, uh, to prevent RV uh, failure. Mechanical insufflation and left ventricular filling. Again, my, uh, my cartoon, each mechanical insufflation will increase alveolar pressure, will increase intratorsing pressure, but, less than the increase in alveolar pressure. And therefore, the transplenary pressure, which is a difference between alveolar pressure and intratorsic pressure, increases at each mechanical insufflation. But this is a good effect for the left ventricular filling because it improves the left ventricular filling. And what about ejection of the left ventricle now? Again, my cartoon, increase in the intratorsic uh, transplanary pressure, which is a difference at each mechanical insufflation. And also, I said before, you also have an increase in the abdominal pressure. But I said before, the difference between the increase in intratorsic pressure and abdominal pressure increases, which is also called the trans diaphragmatic pressure. And this decrease, this increase in the trans diaphragmatic pressure will improve the left ventricular ejection towards the extra thoracic compartment. So each mechanical insufflation will improve the ejection of the left ventricle toward the extra uh, thoracic vessels. And this is very good for the heart because you press on the heart and you eject better. This is good for the heart and especially for patients with left ventricular failure because it helps the ventricle to eject. And this is 
uh, also well illustrated by this study we did in the past. Uh, in my unit, we measured the left ventricular ejection fraction during spontaneous breathing and during mechanical ventilation in the same patients. The LVEF was uh, variable among patients, very low values for some patients, normal values for other ones. But you can notice that except in one patient, mechanical ventilation was able to increase the left ventricular ejection fraction, very good ejection fraction after mechanical ventilation, suggesting that you have an improvement in the global performance of the left ventricle. And it was probably due to an afterload effect because at the same time, we looked at um, using uh, uh, isotopes, uh, we, looks, we looked at uh, also contractility, which was not affected by mechanical ventilation. And therefore, this increase in LVF was more related to improvement in afterload, decrease in afterload, than improvement in contractility. So again, when you use mechanical insufflation, you help the left ventricle to eject. It is more or less the same as if you give a vasodilator, systemic vasodilator uh, to uh, the patient. So good effect on left ventricle ejection. And look, some patients, for example, these patients with very low uh, ejection fraction at baseline improved a lot uh, their LVF during mechanical ventilation. <laughs> now, what about the hemodynamic effects of PEEP application? I will uh, cover the physiological aspects and the clinical aspects. So PEEP and venous return. PEEP and venous return, again, this cartoon, you can understand that if you apply PEEP, you will increase the difference between the right atrial pressure and the mean sneak pressure. And therefore, you should impede venous return. What about PEEP and RV ejection? Again, my cartoon, I like this kind of cartoon. This is a resultant effect I already talked about uh, on the resistance of the lung vessels, extra alveolar vessels, and intra alveolar vessels. If you use a PEEP, which recruits lung units, so recruitive PEEP, normally, if you have a ARDS, for example, you start from this point because the end expiratory lung volume is below the RFRC. So if you recruit lungs, you should increase lung volume and you should decrease a little, but decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance. So if PEEP recruits all the lung units, you should decrease PVR, not increase PVR. If your PEEP is recruited again, and if it recruits all the lung units. So now you start from this before uh, mechanical insufflation. This is a PEEP before at end expiration, of course. And you apply a tidal volume, and you should have a small increase in PVR. But if you use PEEP, which does not recruit a lot lung units or recruits uh, in part, the lungs, but if the majority of PEEP not only re not recruits, sorry, but over distance lung units more than it recruits lung units, you should have a different effect because you should have over distension. And in this case, 
you increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you apply dipole volume after this, you should have a higher increase in PVR. So P, by increasing the alveolar pressure minus intraatrostic pressure, the transmitter pressure should increase PVR by compressing the intraalveolar vessels, essentially if uh, P is not recruited, if it is more distending over distending than recruited. And this can impede uh, RV ejection. And this RV ejection is impeded if alveolar pressure increases more than intratoracic pressure, of course, at insufficient, I already talked about, and with PEEP application, if PEEP does not recruit but over distance. And this, especially in ARDS, where transparent pressure is increased. I mean that because of the low line compliance, at each insufflation, you have an increase in alveolar pressure, which is higher than the increase in intratoracic pressure compared to normal lungs. And therefore, this increase in transmitter pressure has a higher effect on PVR and compression of the intraalveolar vessels, and hence in uh, uh, RV ejection. And this happens if tidal volume and or PEEP are too high. And also when the right arterial function is already altered and more sensitive to changes in its afterward. So in other words, if you have a patient with RV dysfunction, if you apply PEEP, which over distance more than it recruits, you should have a, a, a profound uh, alteration of RV ejection, more than if the right ventricle is normal at baseline. People and LV function, uh, as I said before, you have this, and this increase in trans diaphragmatic pressure should improve the left ventral ejection towards the extrathoracic compartment. Just five minutes ago, I told you that at each mechanical insufficient, you improve LV ejection. It is the same mechanism when you use PEEP. Of course, PEEP is not cyclic, it is static, but you can improve LV ejection by using PEEP, and this could be very beneficial in patients with a left ventricular failure. And this is well uh, illustrated in this, in, in this case. Sorry, I have a, a very, very short squeeze, uh, which is a question to you, but of course, because we have not direct interaction, we are in a, a Zoom meeting, I will ask a question, but I will uh, give the answer. My question was, in congestive heart failure patients, PEEP generally increases cardiac output, decreases cardiac output, exerts no effect or none of these answers. It was a single choice question. And of course, the good answer is this, increases cardiac output in this kind of patients. And this is uh, well illustrated by this study. <laughs> it is an old study, but good study anyway. The authors measured stroke index, stroke volume index, at baseline, at CPAP five centimeters of water, so five centimeters of water PEEP, and CPAP 10 centimeters of water. And they so divided their population in three groups, normal heart. And you see that when you have a normal heart and you apply CPAP, you have a decrease in stroke volume index, especially for CPAP 10. The second category was patients 
with congestive heart failure, but low wedge pressure, low POP, less than 12 meters of mercury. So patients with heart failure, but volume depleted, if you want, with low left ventricular filling pressures. These patients, and again, CPAP decreased stroke volume index, especially for the high level of CPAP. And they also studied a third group, patients with congestive heart failure, but with high filling pressures, more than 12 for PAOP. And they observed the opposite effect. Patients were more severe at baseline. Look at this problem index, which was lower because these patients had severe cardiac dysfunction. And when they applied CPAP, they observed an improvement in stroke volume index on average from 27 to 37 or 36, which is high just by giving CPAP in patients who were uh, breathing spontaneously, of course, but just with CPAP, they improve their stroke index. And this illustrates the beneficial effects of uh, ventilation, invasive or non-invasive ventilation in patients with congestive heart failure, essentially patients with pulmonary edema. What about ARDS and PEEP? <clears throat> another quiz, another question, which is in ARDS, PEEPs, PEEP, in other patients, PEEP generally increases cardiac output, decreases cardiac output, exerts no effect, or it depends on volume status. The correct answer is it depends on volumic status. And I would like to explain you why. <laughs> Again, I, I go back to this cartoon of zone one, zone two, and zone three conditions. The west zones, depending on the relationship between pulmonary artery pressure, which is the upstream pressure for microvessels, the pulmonary venous pressure, which is a downstream pressure for microvessels, and the alveolar pressure, which is directly uh, influencing the uh, capillaries. Hypovolemia favors the extent of zone two. Why? Because it reduces the intravascular pressures and essentially the pulmonary venous pressure. So if pulmonary venous pressure decreases due to hypovolemia, you could have more than more zone two conditions like this. More zone two conditions because sometimes because of the gravity, alveolar pressure, which is constant uh, over the lungs, could be higher than PV pressure, which depends on the gravity. And therefore, you could have more zone two conditions and PVR, pulmonary vascular resistance, will increase with hypovolemia. So hypovolemia could amplify the deleterious impact of mechanical ventilation plus PIP on RV function. Indeed, if you have normal volemia, you can have a PIP, you can have a PVR after tidal volume, but if you have hypovolemia for the same tidal volume, you have and higher PVR due to the higher uh, resistance of the intra-alveolar vessel to the uh, extent of, uh, of the zone two conditions compared to zone three conditions due to hypovolemia. Not because PIP is higher, it is because venous pressure is lower. So in case of hypovolemia, pulmonary, vascular, pulmonary venous pressure is low, zone two are extended and PVR increases more than during normal volume. And this is well illustrated <laughs> by this uh, paper. This is a paper we, we a study we did in our unit years ago. We ventilated patients 
with ARDS and low tidal volume, 6 ml per kilogram. At the beginning, we gave 5 centimeters of water of PEEP, low PEEP. After we increase PEEP without changing tidal volume, and we titrate PEEP to obtain a plateau pressure not higher than 30 centimeters of water. And we looked at the hemodynamic change before and after performing a passive leg raising maneuver, which simulate, uh, which simulate, simulated the volume challenge. We did not give fluid, we just uh, performed PLR as a auto volume challenge. And we measure hemodynamics using a Swangans catheter and echocardiography. Look at the results. <laughs> These here are the results at baseline, minimal peak, five centimeters of water peak, and high peak. We observe a decrease in calic index. We observed an increase in resistance in the lung vessels, increase in PVR, and an increase in the gradient between the pulmonary pressure, the mean PAP, and the POP, which increases with PEEP. At the same time, we measure the right ventricular over the left ventricular and the secular ratio, which is a, a marker of uh, the right ventricle enlargement with PEEP, which increased with PEEP, 0.66 to 0.72. So all these effects cannot be due to a decrease in preload with PEEP, but due to an increase in RV afterload with PEEP. After this, we gave volume. We did not in, infuse, we did not infuse fluids, but we performed passive lag raising, which is more or less the same effect on central blood volume, and we observe an increase in cardiac index, a decrease in the difference between PAP and PLP, and a decrease in the resistance of the lung vessels, which return to their baseline value, and also a decrease in the RV, LV, and the uh, area ratio, which return to baseline value. So therefore, after giving volume or after performing PLR, which, which has the same effect, we observe a decrease in the right ventricular afterload, a decrease in RV afterload. What happened? In fact, by giving volume, I would say by increasing central blood volume with passive leg rising, we increase the pulmonary venous pressure, which, and therefore, we transform zone two conditions to zone three conditions because PVP became higher than alveolar pressure in many zones of the line. And therefore, we decrease PVR. So, giving, giving volume, decrease PVR, and improve RV ejection. This confirms that correction of hypovolemia by decreasing the extent of zone two conditions attenuates the deleterious impact of mechanical ventilation plus PEEP on RV function. What happened when we gave fluid or when we gave volume with PLR, we decreased PVR because we uh, reopen lung vessels by giving more pulmonary venous pressure, and we reduce the compression of lung vessels. If I summarize the hemodynamic effects of PEEP application, I would say that the hemodynamic effects of PEEP are viable, depending on its capacity of recruiting or over distending lungs, so it is very important. The effects can be totally different. If PEEP recruits or over distends, 
its capacity of improving atoll oxygenation, of course, because if you improve atoll oxygenation, you can decrease uh, hypoxemia, you can reduce hypoxemia, and you can decrease the hypoxic vasoconstriction and improve the resistance of the lung vessels. It, degree, it depends on the degree of airway pressure transmission. If you have a CV ARDS, the airway pressure transmission is lower, so the transpinary pressure is higher for a given type of volume. It depends on adaptive mechanisms, of course. If your patient is highly sedated, the adaptive mechanisms can decrease. It depends on volume status. I hope that you are convinced that volume status is very important. It depends on the degree of RV preload dependence and RV afterload dependence and degree of LV preload dependence and LV afterload dependence. So the effects are very variable. And to finish, uh, I almost finished. I have only three slides <coughs> for the hemodynamic effects of prone positioning. To understand the hemodynamic effects, uh, we should remember uh, what are the mechanic, what are the factors which could affect hemodynamics during prone position. Prone positioning is able to increase intraabdominal pressure. It was demonstrated in many studies. It could improve PaO2 due to better uh, matching between uh, lung uh, perfusion and uh, ventilation by recruiting some uh, lung units and also the direct effect on lung recruitment. So three mechanisms, three factors. And these three factors could affect hemodynamics. The increase in PO2 due to the better mismatch, uh, better matching between uh, perfusion and ventilation uh, could decrease the PVR because you decrease the hypoxic uh, pulmonary vessel constriction, but also lung recruitment can decrease PVR. Of course, if you recruit lung, you can, vaso you can dilate uh, the extra alveolar vessels and you can improve uh, vascular resistance. And this improves RV afterload. On the other hand, the intra-abdominal pressure increases with prone positioning, and this will promote systemic venous return. And this increases RV afterload. In addition, the increase in RV afterload will increase the central blood volume. And because you increase the central blood volume, you increase the pulmonary venous pressure and you decrease the zone two conditions. And finally, you improve the pulmonary vascular resistance and you improve afterload of the RV. And if you increase preload and you decrease afterload of the right ventricle, you should improve the RV ejection. So prone positioning should, in theory, should improve RV ejection. And this is what we uh, investigated in this study with Mathieu Zosiak, <laughs> Xavier Monet, and others in my unit some years ago. And the paper was published in the Blue Journal uh, almost, nine, uh, almost 10 years ago now. We uh, studied ARDS patients with low tidal volume and PEEP, which was adjusted to have a plateau pressure not higher than 30 seconds of water. And after this, we prone the patient and we adjusted PEEP to have the same plateau pressure, not to be to have a higher plateau pressure. So same tidal volume and we adjusted PEEP, same plateau pressure. But the patient now is in, in, in the prone position. And we measure Hemodynamics, we looked at hemodynamics using a Swangon catheter, using the PICO uh, technique, and using echocardiography. What we observed, the main results was that 
Karak index improved after prone position, one hour after. We, we measured variables one hour after uh, prone position. And this was associated with an improvement in the difference between PAP and POP and a, a huge decrease in PVR, huge decrease in PVR, confirming that afterload of the left, of the right ventricle improved. In addition, we looked at echocardiographic variables. As you can see, LVF is not affected, but the RV, LV and the sickle rare ratio decreased with prone positioning and the LV eccentricity index, which is a marker of the uh, septum displacement is improved because this is not normal and this uh, goes to normal value. Therefore, we improved RV function with prone positioning. So it is interesting because if you have a, a patient with ARDS and RV dysfunction, you should, you should uh, know that you can improve also uh, RV function with prone positioning. This is another indication of using prone position in ARDS patients. So prone positioning improves RV function by reducing RV afterload, sorry, by reducing RV afterload. This is a mistake in ARDS patients. So now I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope that uh, you have many questions and I could answer your question. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, sir. It's a wonderful presentation. And uh, we have- and it's, uh, an, it's an eye opener for us also, like, you know, in prone positioning, we always feel that, you know, it will lead to increase in intrathoracic pressure, increased abdominal pressure, and it will also lead to uh, increase RV pressure and RV after load will also increase, but this is misnomer. I think this lecture will definitely open up the eyes of all the intensivists. You know, uh, prone position is uh, also going to help you reducing RV pressures and all that. So important. <laughs> uh, so there is one question. How does NIV increases the RV after load and decreases the LV preload? How NIV, non-invasive ventilation? This is by Dr. Arnav. So Non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation increase, uh, increase, both increase the intrathoracic pressure. This increase in intrathoracic pressure could decrease venous return or improve LV ejection. In patients with normal heart, with normal heart, this should decrease venous return more because in normal heart patients, uh, the heart is preload dependent, preload dependent. And therefore, if you decrease venous return, you should have a decrease in cardiac output, decrease in preload and cardiac output. In patients with LV dysfunction, these patients have a heart which is preload independent and afterload dependent. And therefore, you have no effect on preload, no deleterious effects on preload, but if you improve afterload of the left ventricle by, by the support of uh, pressure, intrathoracic pressure, this is exactly if you give vasodilator, arterial vasodilator uh, for the left ventricle, and because the left ventricle is after dependent in congestive heart failure patients, this is a beneficial effect. So if you have a normal heart, maybe you have a normal heart, I hope that I have a normal heart, ventilation, invasive or non-invasive, should decrease cardiac index due to the preload effect on the right side. If you have a failing heart, there is no preload effect because the heart is preload independent and you have the beneficial effect on the left side. Like, this is the, the lungs are like, uh, how to say, they help, you know, they help, they help 
uh, the left ventricle to eject, like a vasodilator decrease afterload. This is more or less the same, but in the opposite way, but finally resulting in improvement in afterload, which is good for, uh, for uh, patients with a heart failure. But in patients with normal heart, there is no beneficial effect on afterload, but there is deleterious effects on preload. So there is a dissociation, preload dependence, afterload dependence, normal heart preload dependence, failing heart afterload dependent. And this is why uh, this uh, uh, study I showed about CPAP showed that the effects are totally opposite in patients with preload dependent heart and pre patients with afterload dependent heart. Moreover, CPAP will also increase transformatory pressure, no sir? And it will also have a squeezing effect on the heart and it will help the heart to pump better with exactly. more force. In, 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 uh, in patients with uh, heart failure, left heart failure. Yeah. yeah. And it this is also why, you, know, you know, some years ago, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it was not very well known. It was not very well known. And people discovered this in the beginning of the 90s because many papers uh, were published uh, demonstrating the beneficial effects of ventilation on the heart in patients with cardiac dysfunction. Yeah. And uh, what is the effect uh, during winning of heart lung contraction? <laughs> yeah, I, I did not talk about winning because, because of lack of time, of course. If you want another time, I can, I can give a talk about uh, winning uh, yeah. and, uh, and heart, uh, heart function because uh, uh, I studied this topic uh, many, many times for 35 years now. And uh, my first paper was about uh, pulmonary edema during weaning from mechanical ventilation. And it was the first paper describing this. Phenomenon. And so I have a, 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 a big lecture about this. And for 35 years now, I tried to study this topic by uh, how to say, by providing clinicians with some uh, very easy tools to detect during the weaning uh, the role of uh, cardiac dysfunction. And uh, there are some tools now published in the literature. We have at least uh, five, six, or seven ways to diagnose uh, weaning induced from edema as a cause of weaning failure. And if you treat these patients, you can help them to, to finally to successfully wean from mechanical ventilation. And in fact, it is more or less the same, but the opposite way. Uh, if you improve, uh, how to say, hemodynamics in patients with cardiac dysfunction with mechanical ventilation, you can induce pulmonary edema when you wean these patients because you impede the left ventricular ejection due to decrease in intrathoracic pressure. And at the same time, you increase venous return and you increase central blood volume with the possibility to induce pulmonary edema. So it is a afterload effect and preload effect. And uh, finally, this can create a very severe pulmonary edema and if you give diuretics sometimes, or if you give nitrates sometimes, it depends, uh, you, you could uh, improve and you could uh, help these patients to win successfully. So this is a very important topic. I, did, I have no time to, dis to, to, to describe all the mechanisms today because it was too short and I, I, I wanted to focus on PEEP and to focus on prone position. So oh, fantastic, really. So, I mean, the NIB will also help us to distribute the fluid from periphery to central hilar area from where it may get absorbed and that will also help us to reduce the workload on the left ventricle. Uh, there is one more question, sir. I mean, uh, one of the uh, doctor, Dr. Arnav has thanked you uh, for this wonderful explanation of the physiology. He has one question. Uh, in heart failure due to diastolic dysfunction, providing PEEP or CPAP will impede venous return and worsen the heart failure since filling pressures are high. And uh, 
So how NIV is going to be helpful in this situation? He's asking this question. <clears throat> uh, he's saying like, you know, uh, NIV may worsen heart failure, probably if the filling pressures are going high. So how to take care of that? Probably he, he's asking that question. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, really, uh, in patients with systolic cardiac dysfunction, uh, mechanical ventilation and PEEP can be very helpful for the heart to, to pump and to eject. Uh, with diastolic dysfunction, it is different, uh, again. And this cannot be, uh, uh, ventilation is not helpful uh, as in, uh, in systolic dysfunction. I totally agree. And you can have deleterious effects, yes. And we know that in these patients, this kind of patient with diastolic dysfunction alone and preserved systolic um, uh, function it is more or less, than, uh, more or less as in a patient with normal heart. It is very difficult to find the optimal preload because if to deplete too much these patients, you can have like hypovolemia. Or if you not deplete, or if you have a small increase in, uh, in pressure, in, uh, in volume, you can have a high increase in pressure uh, because of the compliance of the diacetic function and you can promote preindema. So if there is, an equilibrium point to find, which is very difficult uh, in patients with uh, diocese, isolated diocese dysfunction. A very, very important question. And you cannot improve a cardiac function with ventilation if you have isolated uh, cardiac dysfunction, uh, diocese cardiac dysfunction. You should find the optimal uh, equilibrium. It's difficult, yes. So oh, how do you treat, sir, this diastolic dysfunction in your uh, institute? Yeah, of course, we, we looked at, in all our patients, we looked at, at echocardiography as, uh, as, uh, as much as possible, as frequently as possible, of course. And we, we look at uh, the signs of diastolic dysfunction, of course, the A over E, pre, e prime, the o, E over A, ratios etc and uh, of course we look at this and the size of the of the ventricle of course yes yes it is important but it is a very 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 difficult to 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 deal with situation and any role of uh, diuretics in this condition yes the problem is that if you give diuretics you could improve uh, you could decrease the feeling pressures but there is a risk of decreasing too much preload and to finally to go to the preload, preload dependent patients like normal heart. This is difficult. So there is an optimal point to, to obtain of preload, which is very difficult. If you give too much fluid, you have preloedema. If you deplete too much, you could have hypovolemia or decrease in central blood volume with finally signs of hypovolemia. So it is very good, very difficult situation. It is easier to handle situations like uh, global cardiac dysfunction or with systolic dysfunction. Right, right. Uh, so how do we assess uh, fluid responsiveness in patients with the biventricular failure when we have both right ventricle and left ventricle both are failing? <laughs> It becomes today I did not talk yeah. about fluid responsiveness so again yeah. because of lack of time. See, it could be a yeah. topic for another lecture, okay, of course, okay. as, as you know. Okay. Uh, if you have cardiac dysfunction, global cardiac dysfunction, in general, the patient is fluid and responsive, really. So it is not so difficult to assess because you perform all the tests, PPV or PLR or all the other tests. Uh, to, to, to look at preload responsiveness. In general, you find preload unresponsiveness, unresponsiveness. So it is easy to detect. If you have fluid responsiveness in spite of cardiac dysfunction, okay, you could, you could and sometimes try to give fluid and look at if you improve or not cardiac function. The, the best way in this case is to perform PLR, not like a test, but like a, a how to say, uh, like a reversible uh, free change. 
yeah. if you have an improvement with PLR of uh, hemodynamics, okay, you can try to give uh, through it. If you have no uh, improvement or no significant improvement, I would say, it is not worth it to, to give through it in this kind of patients. Are there any studies uh, which have evaluated optimum PEEP, which will improve the performance of the left ventricle as far as reduction of the after <coughs> beyond a particular PEEP? As you know, the optimal PEEP also depends on uh, the respiratory mechanics, of course. Uh, again, uh, the optimal PEEP is, is a recruitive PEEP, recruitive PEEP. It is good for the lung, it is good for the right ventricle. You understand this? Yeah. But we have not an idle PEEP because no PEEP recruits 100%. You should accept that some PEEP levels recruits more than over the stand. Of course, it will recruit the uh, dependent lungs, dependent zones of the lungs. So you have to, to use some recruitment uh, test, of course. And if PEEP recruits more than over distance, okay, you, you know that PEEP can be also helpful for hemodynamics, in addition to be helpful for, uh, for mechanical, uh, for respiratory mechanics. So, but again, there is no idle PEEP. You should accept some degree of over distension, of course. And the more you over distend, the more you have RV impediment, impediment, and also respiratory mechanics impediments. And so you, it is better, I think, to uh, choose the optimal level of PEEP based on, uh, on respiratory test and to check that also you have no two deleterious effects on hemodynamics rather than to test on hemodynamics. But there are some uh, studies, yes, there are some studies uh, treating PEEP only on hemodynamics, for example, on SVU2 or on SCVU2. And uh, the optimal PEEP, for example, I performed a study in the past, but I did not publish this study, but it was an abstract only. But uh, I was stupid when I was young. I did not uh, uh, write the paper, but it was uh, 35 years ago. And uh, we found that the best SVU2, so we, we, we applied PEEP from 0, 10, and another uh, upper, upper level of PEEP. And we also look at respiratory mechanics at the same time. And we found a close correlation between the optimal PEEP defined by respiratory mechanics and the optimal SVU2. So if you want to follow only SVU2, if SVU2 increases with PEEP is good. And as soon as SVU2 is decreasing, you, you are beyond the optimal point uh, of PEEP. But there are not so many papers uh, looking at this. Not so many papers. But you, you have to check anyway. If you, if you, uh, if you titrate PEEP using respiratory mechanics, you have to check that this PEEP is not uh, deleterious for hemodynamics, of course. And you can use SVU2, you can use whatever you want. Right. So another very interesting question, like uh, what are the physiological uh, mechanisms in a transplanted heart? Does the transplanted heart behave in the same way like a uh, normal heart uh, in, in terms of this uh, heart-lung interaction? So what is your uh, experience? Uh, the, the, answer, the, the answer, yeah. Uh, first, I have no, no much experience on transplantation because I don't uh, work in a, in a, in a unit uh, which, uh, which manage this kind of patients. But the answer is in the question. Uh, regarding the pure mechanical effects, you should have the same uh, consequences of mechanical ventilation and weaning, et cetera, et cetera. 
But because you have the inhibited heart, you have not these compensatory mechanisms which normally should try to, to reduce the deleterious effects. For example, for cardiac index, et cetera. Normally, you should have uh, some uh, adaptive mechanisms in, uh, in normal people, in awake people. If you, if you sedate your people too much, the adaptive mechanisms are, are not as uh, strong and you have more uh, deleterious effects, of course. Uh, so it, it is the same for mechanical effects, but because of the lack of adaptive mechanisms, you should have uh, more pronounced deleterious effects. But it depends also on the uh, cardiac function. If cardiac function is good, you have more deleterious effects. If cardiac function is not good, you have more beneficial effects. <laughs> this is the opposite of uh, a normal heart, yeah. Right. Sir, another question is like any role of uh, dobutamine with low cardiac index and elevated filling pressure by Dr. Arnab. If the map is maintained, if the map is maintained, is there any role of dobutamine in patients with a low cardiac index and elevated filling pressure. Yes, but you don't speak about uh, heart lung interaction in this case. It is uh, whatever whatever uh, ventilation in patient with mechanical ventilation or in patient without mechanical ventilation. I mean, no, because because the, the butamine has the same effects on mechanical ventilation patients and patients without mechanical ventilation. So, so this is a general aspect of uh, treating patients with cardiac dysfunction, whatever ventilation. So if you have a cardiac dysfunction with low cardiac index and elevated feeling pressures and maintain MAP, of course, the butamine is a good, a good uh, treatment. But in my practice, I use the butamine only in three conditions. Of course, these conditions, of course, low cardiac index plus elevated feeling pressures plus maintain MAP, but also low SVU2 or high PC2 gap or markers of peripheral hypoperfusion. I mean that if the patient is not in shock with peripheral hypoperfusion, if SVU2 is in the normal range, if PC2 gap is not high, even if I uh, look at cardiac function using echo, even if cardiac index is low, even in feeling pressures is high, of I, I don't give dobutamine because it is not worth it. I give dobutamine only if I have some signs of shock and low SVU2 or high PC2 gap. Because if you have a normal PC2 gap, it is not worth it to increase cardiac output. You have no beneficial effect, finally. Because, because if you have normal PC2 gap, it means that Cardiac output is adapted to the metabolic conditions. If you have a low a, a normal SVU2, it means that oxygen delivery is adapted to metabolic conditions. So there is no reason to give the butamine in this case, even if you discover cardiac dysfunction using echo. This is what we, we said in a consensus uh, conference. Uh, 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 we did. Uh, in the uh, ESICM some years ago, we said that isolated cardiac dysfunction discovered or confirmed by echocardiography without signs of shock, without high PC2 gap, et cetera, does not require inotropic treatment. Because as you know very well, because you are intensivist as me, the deleterious effects of the butamine are also uh, very, very important to consider. Arrhythmias, vasodilation, uh, tachycardia, increase in oxygen demand of the myocardium, etc. So finally, if you cannot expect 
beneficial effects. For example, in case of normal PC2 gap, there is no reason to give the butamine because you can expect deleterious effects. So I would be very, very careful uh, when I give the butamine. I reserve the butamine only in case of uh, shock, of course, plus uh, doc documented cardiac dysfunction and normal uh, and high PC2 gap or low SD2. So, I think we have no more questions. Yeah, and we have already crossed uh, more than one hour, and your time is very important, sir. I mean, uh, it was really an eye opener for all of us, and really, uh, you gave us a lot of insights about heart lung interaction. This uh, video will be also available for the students uh, for further. You know, if they want to use uh, this video, I mean, to learn again and again is uh, every day is uh, a, a process. Uh, I must thank you uh, for this uh, deliberation today, sir. I would uh, request uh, Dr. Gunadar to give word of thanks and uh, we can conclude this section. Yeah. So before I thanks, actually, there is a request uh, for sir to take uh, many such good lectures and like, sir. Excellent uh, lectures for our... Uh, and sir, group. India is the second home for you. <laughs> I've seen you. Know, I mean, last time we met and you already oh. said that it is like second home for you. So please so, consider this as uh, our second uh, visiting hospital and would like to see you in person as well. You know, uh, in coming uh, November or December, we have, we have still not planned the program. Uh, we would wish to see you in our hospital and probably one-to-one -one interaction will be more useful. Uh, oh, yeah. Although yeah. today's discussion was worth uh, listening, uh, but uh, would like to see you in person again. And so they have requested, of, uh, students have requested. So a lot of, lot of uh, thanks from Dr. Arnav, Dr. Prashant and uh, Dr. Guru Prasad. So these are our fellow intensivists practicing across India. So uh, Many thanks from their side, and definitely it is. It was an interesting and very exciting sessions, and thank I you. thank from the behalf of the Apollo Hospital and the Apollo family, and uh, we also anticipate a lot of good lectures from your side, sir, for and from your permission. Oh, th 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 thank you very much again for the invitation. I, you know, you know, you know that I like I like uh, Indian uh, intensivists. I have a lot of friends. Yeah. In uh, India, a lot of friends in India and among intensivists, a lot of friends. And it's not to flatter you, uh, but uh, I notice I, I travel a lot by Zoom or, <laughs> or not. Uh, and I notice that uh, knowledge and uh, curiosity of Indian intensivists is very high. Compare compare to compare to other I don't know other countries if you want. Thank you, thank you. The, the knowledge is very high. Absolutely. The curiosity is very 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 high, and uh, it is always very easy to to share because there is a direct interaction. I know that you understand very well what I mean, and and, and I understand what you mean, and and this is what is very interesting in this communication with Indian intensivists for me. This is why I like to, to interact uh, with you, with Indian intensivists. And I like to also to, to, to come to India because this is easy. This is easy because the knowledge of intensivists in India is excellent. Probably because training, teaching, education is excellent. This is why it is very easy. It's, this I like the questions also asked by you, by the attendees, but this is always what I notice compared to other countries. And uh, because your system of education in medicine is very good, finally, at least intensive care, I don't know the other specialties. And, and finally, the level is very, very, very high. The only thing to, not good thing to say is that you do not translate too much this knowledge to publications. Yes. We yeah. are like yeah. So yeah. more and more research is needed actually from the young yeah. generation and budding intensivist. That is yeah. what the need of the time. The knowledge is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. 
and uh, because of the education system uh, and also many many lectures many conferences many webinars many uh, we had you ha you propose a lot of things you propose a lot of things and uh, so the gap now is to to correct this uh, lack we of to fill this gap so we'll take uh, this inspiration ahead and yeah. we'll we'll try to match up the expectations as well yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. exactly yes. exactly and and you have really mesmerized us with the topic today. I mean, understanding physiology of heart and lung interaction. You won't Thank be you. able to see in the textbooks also probably. I mean, you must have compiled data from various sources with your own research uh, that you have put in. I mean, it's really commendable and I don't think we'll be able to see in the textbook also. So really, thank so, you very much, thank sir. You. Thank you to all the delegates and uh, thank you to all our attendees today, my fellow colleague intensivists and faculties. Mm -hmm. And uh, special thanks to Abul sir, and hope to see you soon, sir, in the future. Uh, in the see you in Paris, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, sir.